thank you guys all for coming. We're fortunate to have uh, Uso Renermo here today um, from uh, Rutgers. Uh, Uso did her undergraduate and master's work at the University of Copenhagen and was then essentially recruited out of an EGU presentation to do a PhD at Princeton, which is, uh, which is really cool. And uh, then went on to do a uh, postdoc at UCLA with Larry Smith. Um, her recent work uh, in Greenland is actually touching on some of the really, really cool stuff that's been going on. We've always been, we've been thinking for a long time about uh, Greenland ice melt and the ice melt going into the ocean. And this idea of it actually being retained someplace like glacially or within the glaciers is something that puts this is work right at the back end. So um, without any further ado, I'll uh, All right, is this good? Is this good volume? All right, let's see. Oh, there we are. OK, I, I'm going to start by just, uh, well, thank you for inviting me to come. I'm really excited to be here. It's really fun to meet with uh, all the students earlier. It's like a really terrific program you guys got here. So I'm excited to be here. Uh, so yeah, so I'm uh, Olsa Renamon, assistant professor at the Department of Geography at, at Rutgers. So I want to uh, first give a little bit of background about uh, Greenland and uh, why it's important. And uh, I, I, I'm not completely 100% sure. I know a lot of you work on Greenland, but I'll do it anyway, just in case for those three people who don't know. And, uh, and then I'll, I'm going to talk about my research, looking into uh, providing evidence for meltwater retention and, and delayed release of meltwater to the ocean. All right, here's some pictures, actually, from my fieldwork uh, on the ice sheet surface. And uh, you can see us doing some measurements there on a stream and, and then a, a stream network in the ablation zone. This is what it looks like when meltwater is produced and being transported on the surface. It's extremely fascinating. All right, I, I can't talk about Greenland and not say anything uh, about the, the, um, the absolutely remarkable year that we saw last year in 2012. So uh, if you're not aware of it, but last year, in be beginning of uh, July, uh, pretty much the entire ice sheet was experiencing surface melting. This map is uh, derived from satellite, passive satellite remote sensing imagery, and it shows in red the uh, surface of the ice sheet that experienced surface melt at this time. Um, as you can see, the entire uh, ice sheet is red. There is uh, not barely a white spot here. And, uh, and Mary uh, Albert and other people have shown that uh, this was actually, this is extraordinary. If you look through ice cores and so on, you'll see that this has maybe happened three times or something like since the medieval warm period. So it's a, absolutely uh, an, a remarkable event and has not been observed in the uh, satellite record, which goes back to the late 70s. And to just show you what it looks like a few days before this event, which sort of is more the, the usual summer melt that we've seen in, in Greenland over the last couple of decades, you can see that you have a lot of melting in the south of Greenland and along the coast, but not in the interior, which is what we saw here. So um, I don't know how many, like maybe you have had like 100 gazillion uh, slideshows of the dramatic uh, impact of, of this uh, on, on, uh, on the bridge of, of in um, Kangalusuak in southwest Greenland. But I, I just want to show you just some of, if, in case there's somebody that didn't get it, because I, I was in Greenland when, when uh, this melt event occurred. And I, I don't know what you got. I know there was a group of Igor students who arrived around that time. And I, did you come in with a ju ju July 10th or 11th or something? Right after, all right, so I was there like before it started. So I sort of witnessed like, um, so we have this town in Southwest Greenland, Kangalusuak, which is the hub of research uh, for a lot of Greenland research. And so that's where all, many of the, Iger, I think most of the Igor students come in there and uh, a lot of researchers. So I was there, I was sort of in between field seasons. And, um, and, uh, and, and at this point, I didn't, we didn't know that the entire ice sheet was experiencing surface melt. But what I did notice was that the levels in the river were starting to increase. And people, and people were telling me, you got to go down and check out the river. So I started walking down there, and it was like remarkable. This, the levels in the river was increasing. 
And uh, although this is, a, this is a really small town, <clears throat> only has about 400 inhabitants or something like that, but it's, it's, it's important from an infrastructure uh, perspective. It's like the main airport hub of Greenland. And uh, it's important, this bridge is important for, for the townies because you have fresh water supply coming over this bridge. And it's also, the, the best restaurant in Greenland is on the other side of the bridge. <laughs> And this year, for the first time, I sort of, I got to go to that restaurant, but um, unfortunately, the water levels kept on rising, and uh, the county started working 24-7 to try and save the bridge here, and uh, eventually, they had to stop because their equipment fell in. And I, maybe at this time, you had arrived, yeah? I don't know. Yeah, the bridge was out. The bridge was out. So this is like before it went out. It was so dramatic. Like this one, the wheels were turning <laughs> on this machine here. And it's just started sinking. You can see how the water is like flowing over the bridge. This bridge has been here probably since the 50s. It's built by the US uh, military. And, uh, and of course, never ever has uh, rivers, the river been this high uh, over the history of, of this bridge. And eventually, this thing was wiped out. And uh, here is probably what you saw, the bridge after it's gone. So this was very dramatic, 2012. A massive melt event, and the first time I've seen this uh, kind of catastrophic consequences on, on the civilization of, of Greenland. But this trend, it, or this extreme, is part of a trend, right? It's not something that just happened one year and it was extreme. No, it follows like a gradual um, um, pattern of increased mass loss from the Greenland ice sheet. This, this uh, slide here shows uh, observations with the, the gray satellite, um, uh, which is using uh, gravity anomalies to determine how much ice and, uh, ice and, and meltwater is being lost from Greenland each year. And you can see here over, it shows uh, mass loss. When increasingly ne negative numbers mean more mass loss. And then you can see time here on the, on the uh, horizontal axis. So it's, it's a record that goes back about a decade, and you can see how, how it's been uh, uh, more and more negative numbers, meaning more net mass loss uh, from Greenland to the global oceans. And in fact, it's been accelerating. So it's not just a decline, it's an acceleration. If we look at the longer time series records that we have of, for example, surface melt that goes back to the late 70s, uh, I did an analysis of, of uh, the extreme melt events that's uh, been recorded there. I took the, this, this figure here shows the 100 most extreme daily melt events in Greenland, and I did a histogram to see when they occur. And if you look at this, uh, on, on the, on the uh, vertical axis is the frequency of, of these uh, events, and the horizontal shows the time. What you see here is that fairly almost none of these 100 most extreme events occur in the early part of the records. In, in fact, 50% of them occurred since 2005. So something, 2012 was remarkable, and it's part of a bigger pattern. All right, who, who, was, who went to the Greenland in 2013 for, for the IGERT? And yeah, a couple? Yeah, you, yeah. So then we come to 2013. That was kind of an unremarkable year. <laughs> <laughs> this is what my data shows. I, I have some observations where I observe ice sheet uh, runoff in, in rivers draining the ice sheet. And uh, what you see here is the cumulative river discharge over, over the melting season. So it's going to be increasing because melting uh, con increases over the, the season. All right, so what you see here in, in red uh, is the uh, amount of uh, cumulative meltwater from 2012. And the stipple line is the average from, from the time period that I've done these measurements. And this uh, catchment that I'm studying is only uh, measuring runoff from the very uh, the ice margin. So I haven't seen much variability over the uh, years I've been there. And you can see even 2012 is not that extreme compared to the average. But 2013 is certainly like extreme on the other way much less meltwater coming out. And uh, I've been part of uh, putting together the Arctic report card for 2013, so I can tell you all that this is 
actually also seen in a range of other observations of Greenland last summer. And just one example here, this is again the uh, surface melt extreme, extent derived from passive remote sensing. And uh, what you see in red is the uh, percent of the ice sheet that uh, experienced surface melt uh, during uh, 2012. So you can see this huge peak there in, in early uh, July where it almost goes up to 100%. And then the black line shows the average over the observational period going back to 1979. And the blue line shows 2013. So 2013 was sort of an average year. So for me, that's obviously interesting because it suggests that all my observations have been observations of ex sort of extreme years, where, whereas maybe last year is sort of how it's been for the most part over the last three decades. But all of this is just to, to point out that there is a great variability in um, in, uh, in Greenland surface melt and, uh, and, and, and strong trends occurring over, over the last uh, decades. And why is this important? Well, it's important because this water goes somewhere. It goes into the ocean and it uh, plays a role in uh, global sea level rise. So here's an image of, of different factors contributing to the observed changes in global sea level rise over the last two decades. And it, just to point on Greenland here, the, the white line shows the combined from, from, from the two ice sheets and, and, um, and I think thermal expansion is part of this too. Uh, so basically the point is here, Greenland plays a really important role in global sea level rise at the moment. And if we look at the draft of the, the the IPCC R5 report that's coming out is going to, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of this figure, but what it shows is different uh, scenarios for projected sea level change into the future. The take home message is that the estimates are between 0.2 and 0.8 meters, but that there is some uh, uh, a range here depending on what kind of cha climate change scenario we're getting. And one thing that they point out uh, the working group that pr produced this uh, estimates in their uh, analysis of this, and I've highlighted here some of their comments in the figure text, is that uh, when it comes to understanding uh, rapid ice sheet discharge uh, as a consequence of destabilizing the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets, um, currently we don't know enough to understand how that is going to be uh, dependent on different uh, scenarios of change. So this is a, an important thing to study and try to quantify. And um, just a final note about, about this, like yesterday, I, I, so I work in New Jersey, like Rutgers in New Jersey, and um, uh, we were hit really hard by uh, Hurricane Sandy. And yesterday we had a big conference at Rutgers where we, we, we talked about the event and what we can do about it. And I, I got some new uh, estimates here because of, 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 the imp of sea level change in, in, in New Jersey. Because it turns out that, okay, so the, the 0.2 to 0.8 meters of sea level rise, that's a global sea level rise. That's the average. Well, a place like New Jersey is likely to experience more sea level rise. And yesterday, uh, three experts revealed some new studies suggesting that in New Jersey, you might see between 0.8 to point, almost two meters of sea level rise. That's, that's the range, right, uh, by uh, 2100. So uh, that, that is going to be significant. All right. So uh, how does my work fit into this? So when we think about mass loss from the green ice sheet, all right, there's two uh, main forms of mass loss. OK, first, we have ice discharge. So this is ice that's lost through calving glaciers directly into the ocean. And the second form is surface meltwater runoff. And this is uh, what I'm studying. And it turns out that right now, runoff is about half the total mass loss. And we know this from spatially distributed uh, mass balance models, surface mass balance models. And they all point in the same direction, increased runoff over the last decade, 
particularly since the mid-90s. Well, these spatially distributed models, they can tell us how, mu how much runoff it's produced. But what they don't really tell us is how much reached the ocean. So you might think, OK, everything reaches the ocean. But that's a kind of very simplified way of thinking of the ice sheet. So if we think about the ice sheet, this is sort of a, just a cross section of the ice sheet. You see some hydrological input and output arrows with precipitation and melt and runoff and so on. And you can think about the ice sheet consisting of some ice. You have the fern and snow. And I know several of you here probably have a much more sophisticated gradual um, thought of, of, of the ice sheet. But in, a, in a sort of a, a very simple way, you can think about it this way. And, um, but there's so much more to the ice sheet than, than just these three components and just ice. Because you have a lot of hydrology on the ice sheet, too. So if I'm just going to overlay some hydrological features here, you'll see this really complex system here <laughs> with uh, all kinds of transportation pathways and potential storage elements. Like recently in uh, east, uh, southeast Greenland, they have discovered um, aquifers of water under, in the fern, like underneath, like maybe 10, 20 meters below the surface. Um, you have uh, percolation of meltwater into, into fern. You have uh, cavities, subglacial cavities uh, containing meltwater and so on. So you have, there's a lot of potential here for meltwater storage. And in fact, there was a study last year published trying to quantify the, uh, the, the importance of, of meltwater storage, looking at how much could be, how, how much meltwater export could be buffered by simply percolating into fern instead of running up to the ocean. So this is a study by Joel Harper and others. And all these little, um, all these lines here are different scenarios. So they sort of provide a range of uh, possible um, scenarios into the future. And, uh, and then uh, it shows uh, how, how many years uh, that fern, uh, per meltwater percolation into fern could be buffered um, uh, instead of escaping to the ocean as a function of elevation. So the take home message here is that it can uh, be uh, buffered up to a couple of decades by, by this potential storage in fern. Exactly how many decades is, is uh, unclear, but uh, a couple of decades. So this and other thing can limit the amount of, of meltwater that's actually being released. So, so the, the models make estimates of this, but they're, they're, they're quite variable and, and, uh, and not really based on, on a, a, a deeper understanding of this. Um, <coughs> And finally, another reason why we need to understand and look at surface hydrology of the ice sheet and, and look at runoff, th what I'm doing, is to try and understand how uh, meltwater production and transportation is linked to the dynamics of the ice sheet. And I just want to illustrate this by uh, another study that was made uh, a few years ago by Sundal and others. What we see here is uh, a graph that shows uh, in a year with a lot of melt, uh, shows runoff as in yellow here over a melting season. And then you see uh, the line here is showing ice sheet velocity. So what you can see there is uh, what you sort of can expect, like meltwater, when, when the um, melting season starts, you have an increase in runoff, and you also have an increase in velocity of the ice sheet. And then it sort of falls off as you know, you reach the peak of the melting season, and it all starts declining. What's interesting is that they compare this with a situation where you have, where you don't have so much melting going on, and looked at the velocity then. And what they found is this. So the blue here shows the runoff this year, the runoff production on the surface of the ice sheet. So uh, you can see that it's much less than the blue, the, the yellow blob. What's interesting is if you look at the velocity. So just like in the year with high melt, you have an increase in velocity of the ice sheet. But in the difference, what's happening here is like, while in, in the high melt year, the velocity starts declining, it stays high 
in the air with little melting. All right, this sort of goes against uh, some theories that were put forward that if you have a lot of surface melting, you'd expect it to, to somehow reach the base of the ice sheet and lubricate the ice sheet and it will flow faster. But what we see here is like if you have a lot of melting, you, the ice sheet slows down. Now, how is that possible? So it seems some kind of self-regulation going on here. So the answer might be in the subglacial network itself. So you can think about the subglacial network uh, transitioning between two states. Where one state is uh, shown in panel A here, which is a channelized system that's highly effective and in transporting meltwater out of from the glacier to, to the ocean, to rivers and, and, and fjords. These kind of system uh, develops if you have lots of meltwater being transported uh, into the ice sheet. And, uh, it's, uh, and the uh, contrast is what you see in, in panel B here, which is sort of a, a more distributed system w uh, with uh, linked cavities. And, uh, and, and the thought is that uh, that uh, when, when you have development of a, a channelized system, meltwater will be efficiently transported out of the ice sheet. Whereas if you have this, uh, fat, uh, uh, this linked cavity system, you, meltwater is not transported out of the ice sheet as efficiently, and you can have water pressure building up underneath uh, at the base of the ice sheet, which could then sort of induce uh, ice sheet velocity. All right. So. So some of the science question that I'm looking into, it's sort of linked to these two issues. So first, one thing that I, I'm examining is how much uh, meltwater actually do escape to the ice sheet by using in situ methods, not re relying completely on models. And where does this meltwater come from? Is all meltwater trapped in the interior, or is, is it only meltwater uh, reaching the ocean coming from, from the edges of the ice sheet? Where does it come from? And finally, how is it transported to the ocean? So I'm gonna, I hope I have time to talk about um, three studies that I made that looks into some aspects of this, all right? So all my studies are, are sort of based in southwest Greenland near the town of Kangalusuak, which is sort of highlighted here with an arrow. And um, and the first study I'm going to show you is, is an analysis of a, a small watershed. I call it an ice sheet control watershed because it has a very small proglacial area. So there's a very limited impact of the proglacial environment. So what you can assume for this area is that if there's nothing, if, if uh, if, uh, if there's no, no, no storage mechanism here, everything that's being produced, all the runoff produced on the ice sheet, should run off to the, to the river, straining this ice sheet drainage area. And if it doesn't, if there's a difference between the two, that is attributed to retention or release from the ice sheet, okay? There could be a little bit of an error term here as well. Okay, so here's a close-up of my study area. So uh, the, uh, the green arrow here, AK4, that's like where I measure stream discharge, all right? As you can see, I have three different boundaries here for the watershed area. It turns out this is probably the highest uncertainty of the study, actually figuring out what is the upstream contributing area into this watershed. And uh, the reason why that is, is difficult is because you can, there's different ways to determine this area. There are different theories on how you would do it. Or, and there's, the data availability is all, not always that great. So I made three possible uh, delineations. I'm gonna show you like a range of, of results here. And it's basically because when you delineate uh, watersheds on ice, you, uh, as, uh, when you look at it in, on a terrest in, in the terrestrial environment on land, you use, you typically use surface topography. And that is the first approximation for a watershed area in Greenland too. But what also will influence where water is coming from is, uh, 
is the, the topography of, of the, of the uh, bedrock as well, and the overburdened pressure of the ice sheet. So um, while we have pretty good information about the surface elevation of the ice sheet, the bedrock topography is, is less, uh, we have less data on that. And in fact, there's more uncertainty uh, about that data. You have some data that seem um, questionable. So I uh, had to come up with these uh, three, different, uh, three different realizations to, uh, to provide a range. And in fact, um, uh, they, they sort of uh, mask. Uh, the way I would think about these three realizations is that the smallest watershed is sort of probably the smallest, it's the lowest boundary, the absolute minimum is based on uh, very uh, uneven uh, data uh, availability. So it's highly influenced by which data point that was, that was available at this time. But anyway, it provides a range. So somewhere between Watershed 3 and Watershed 1 is, is the true story. All right, so that's my watershed. For that watershed, I've estimated runoff uh, by using probably the best method that's available because it turns out this part of Greenland, there's automatic weather stations running 24-7 all year round unless technical stuff makes it break down, right? And they're close to these watersheds. So I highlight them here in red. So I've been able to estimate the runoff production on the ice sheet using weather station data that's really close to this and being able to construct like a model that's based on elevation. So it probably cannot get better than this. So that's like the input to the system, right? That's the meltwater input. And the output I've quantified by field observation of river discharge downstream of, of this watershed. So imp that's the inputs at the output. What have we learned? All right, I'm going to show you. If we look at the cumulative um, Runoff on the ice sheet. Over, I have I have data here from uh, from uh, 2008 to 2011. If we look at that, uh, we'll see this uh, increase every year when when the melting season kicks off. Okay. If we think about what kind of discharge we would expect downstream of this, if there's no storage going on in the ice sheet, we would expect that discharge in the stream would just be slightly delayed. So it would look something like this, right? But since we have some uncertainty with the watershed delineation, we have sort of a range of, of, uh, of um, possibilities here between the red line, which is the lowest, uh, the smallest catchment. So let me show you what really came out of, the, of, the, of this catchment. So this is what came in, all right? This is what came out. The blue line here shows the river discharge. And there's some really interesting uh, differences here that I will uh, point out in, uh, in, uh, in some other slides. But as you can see to a first order, it sort of falls in between these two, uh, these two uh, uh, extreme uh, watershed delineations. All right, so I wanna, I wanna show you on a yearly, on a melt year basis, uh, a breakdown of, of how much is retained and released. So I'm gonna split it up by year now. And, uh, and, uh, and show that uh, for each year. So what we're looking at here is for this, the largest watershed at the top and the smallest watershed at the bottom, these bars show the percent of the ice sheet runoff that uh, is retained if it's positive values and it's released to the, to the rivers if, it's, if they're negative. And uh, the way to interpret this here is that the, the bottom plot shows the lower limit here. And uh, what I really want to, and, and the two bars, the color bars, are just two different ways of calculating discharge to provide a range. But I mean, the, what, what you see here is that the water catchment area is the, is the dominant in factor influencing this. But the, what I want to point out here is that um, if you look at, uh, at the larger catchment, what this, is, this input output analysis suggests is that uh, in uh, that up to 54% of the runoff produced on the ice sheet may be retained within the ice sheet. All right, so this might be the upper boundary of this. Okay, and 
And that's definitely the most extreme value. OK, so if we look closer into, into this process and look at the time series instead, now the previous shows the total, year total. Now we're looking at the time series of, 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 of runoff from the ice sheet in, in red here over these three years. So you can see the, the, the kind of melt uh, season signal you would expect. You have increase in the spring, it melts over the summer, and then it declines in the fall, and then it comes up again. All right, if we, let me show you what the runoff looks like. Here's the runoff, uh, or the river discharge here in blue. So first of all, you see that you have less river discharge, but you also see some very different, some, some interesting uh, discrepancies here. And to highlight those, I have, subtracted these two time series from each other. And uh, that's shown here in blue. So negative numbers here means that um, you have more river discharge than, than uh, ice sheet runoff. And positive numbers mean more ice sheet runoff. All right, look at these three events here. These are times when you have water in the river, but no meltwater produced on the ice sheet. That means that water cannot come from ice sheet meltwater production at that time, right? It must be delayed release of some form. And if you look at it, it occurs at, time, it occurs at times when there is no melting. It occurs early in the season or in the fall after melting has occurred. And I've analyzed this, looked at uh, the uh, other Waste. This is the uh, the other catchment delineation scenario. You still see these three pulses of, of meltwater coming out at times with with little runoff. And I even looked into the fact. Can, I mean, this is happening in the winter. I'm not there in the winter. The, this is recordings made with with uh, data loggers that's installed in the stream. And uh, you know what? What? Who knows what's going on there? And it turns out I have some idea what's going on there. So I'm going to show you why I'm convinced that there is indeed water coming out at this time. Because um, how we determine discharge is uh, by constructing a, 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 an empirical rating curve relating discharge to measurements of water pressure from a pressure transducer. And uh, here's a picture showing uh, the discharge in blue and the pressure transducer recording in, in black, which is sort of the raw data that we base all this upon. And you see in that data, you really see this is the November event in, uh, in 2008. And you see in the, in, the, in the pressure discharge that it's really something's going on here. And in fact, actually, there is something going on in the ice sheet that's shown here in, in green. There is some kind of event going on right when this before at the beginning of, of this, uh, this meltwater pulse. It turns out that uh, the total volume of meltwater in this event here from the ice sheet, it doesn't, it's only a fraction of uh, what's actually in the river. So much, it doesn't, can't explain it. So what's interesting, well, the smoking gun here is provided by, by these pressure transducer, which besides pressure also does another uh, recording and it measures another variable which is an amazing thing to observe namely temperature so i have temperature information from the same time as i have these pressure anomalies being recorded and this is what that looks like this is a blue line shows the temperature at, the, at this time in the stream so what you see here before this event the temperature is sort of below zero and then when this event kicks off, it increases rapidly and it stays around zero the whole time. This is a typical uh, pattern that you see when you have um, thawing going on. Like all the energy goes to, to, um, to melting of ice. Or you have liquid water here. Another thing that makes me convinced that we have liquid water here is the fact that uh, this pressure transducer were actually exposed to the air before the meltwater came out. So what we're seeing here is not an artifact of a big ice layer on the sensor. In fact, this sensor was exposed to the air. And I know this because I have another sensor measuring air temperature. And it's shown here in red. And you can see how these move in concert until this event strikes. So I think this is real. All the other observations show a similar thing. 
So what this really shows is that we can have up to 50%, 50% or so meltwater retain. About 10% of it can be lost in the cold season. So it's the delayed release. So we have this water coming out. Where does it come from? Where does meltwater come from, from the Greenland ice sheet? To look at this, I, I did a study where I compared my small catchment that, only, that measures the amount of meltwater coming off the margin with a larger catchment that actually extends all the way to the sort of continental divide of, of Greenland. And that is the, uh, the Watson River, the mighty Watson River that, that uh, it blew out that bridge that I showed you earlier. And, and that catchment is shown in, 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 uh, in light blue here on the map. And my catchment is like just a little dot by the margin. So um, what I want to show you now is a study where I'm, I'm using this. This is in situ data. This is like data. I mean, this is data that really shows how much meltwater actually came off the ice sheet. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to use this in sort of a nested um, way to uh, separate the contribution from the ice margin with the contribution of meltwater coming upstreams or it, it from, from further inland. So to do this, I took the ice, my small catchment by the margin and upscaled that, the, that uh, observation to the entire, assuming it's representative for the uh, entire area below uh, the same elevation, which means I can separate the amount of uh, discharge coming below and uh, above 850 meters, because that's how high up my catchment goes. So, so this is sort of the idea. You take the total discharge from the Watson River, and you subtract the, the, the estimate of, of ice margin discharge. And that leaves you with the discharge coming from higher elevations. So that's sort of start, now we can start breaking down where it comes from, based on observations. So if we look at uh, time series of, of this, here I put the uh, discharge from the ice margin in, in red and discharge from the interior in, uh, in blue. So what you can see here is that you barely can see the ice sheet margin discharge because it's dwarfed by the discharge coming from the interior, at least in the last couple of years. But look in 2008, they're almost equal. Then 2009, some separation. And then 2010 is quite large, a little less than 2011. And 2012, the uh, interior signal is much, much larger than what's happening at the, at the margin. So what we see here is that there's great variability in the interior, not so much by the margin. And uh, if you look, if you quantify this on an annual basis, and see uh, the fraction of, of meltwater coming from, from the edge versus the margin. Here we see the, the percent that's coming from the margin. You can see sort of a, um, a decline here from 2008 to 2012, suggesting that in this period you have more meltwater coming from the interior. So this is like, a, what, five years? So we can't really talk about a trend here, especially knowing that 2013 was probably completely different. But still. Not all meltwater is produced in the interior gets trapped in fern. Some of it escapes to the ocean. That's, that's the point here. All right, I want to I wanna end up by just showing some really recent study uh, that we're working on right now, looking at uh, using stream chemistry to try and understand where the meltwater is coming from. So in 2012, when, uh, when this crazy event happened, we were like, OK, we're in Greenland. The most extreme melt event ever is occurring. <laughs> what do we do? So we started collecting like water sam samples. We weren't, we weren't allowed. They really, they didn't. It was hard because the police thought, tried to. They had to like. They didn't want you to go to the water. But we did collect water samples, and we have analyzed it for. For yeah, I was. I was. Uh, the police were telling me like, don't go there. So was, yeah. Anyway, anyway. But I, I. I got it. I got it. I got it. So we, we got some water, we, we looked at it. We looked at the composition and concentration of solutes during this peak. 
And I, I just want to show you some preliminary results because I, I think it's really interesting. So uh, here's a figure. Uh, we're working on a manuscript right now. What you see here is uh, the, the, the shaded uh, 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 gray in the background here. It, that's the discharge, estimated discharge at Watson River in 2012. So this is what it looks look like. So you see the big peak there in mid-July at the center of, of this uh, curve. And then you see actually a secondary peak uh, towards uh, early, early August. And at that time, like the bridge was gone. So we didn't really recognize that there was, we didn't really get it that it was the second peak. And I mean, I actually, I left around that time. But so that's why, like, all the dots here shows the uh, water samples we took. So we took a lot of water samples during the event, like when we, when we realized, wait, oh, wait a minute, we got to do something here. <laughs> took took uh, a few hours. But then we started sampling. And, but we sort of, uh, unfortunately, didn't sample as frequently. So we don't have the second peak. We don't have as many observations. We, we, <laughs> the water level didn't seem that dramatic, but it was actually pretty big, too. But anyway, there's something we can learn from this. Uh, I, there's a lot of information here. I'm just going to point out something. And maybe since I know, there's like people who know chemistry here, which I don't. So uh, I could maybe see something that I can't. But, but basically, uh, the message here is that uh, these cat, and the top panel here is a plot of cation concentrations. And, uh, and that is typically or originates from uh, subglacial weathering. That's water that's. In, water enriched in, in cations probably has been in the subglacial environment for a bit where, where they have been exposed to weathering. The opposite is uh, stuff like chloride, which, uh, which is being, at, when, when the surface is melting, as far as I understand, it's getting enriched in, in fern. So if you see a lot of chloride, you would expect that come from melting of fern. So the way to interpret this is that what you see here uh, occurring sort of in, in tandem with the peak. Uh, you see this declining uh, chloride concentration that sort of follows the decline in, in this charge here, suggesting that uh, a lot, this, this discharge peak is, is, is controlled by melting. The, the meltwater is coming from the surface. It's fern melting on the surface. And then you see this, what's happening here. It's like after the peak in this charge, there's a peak in cation concentrations coming after this massive melt peak, right? So the way we interpret this is that what we have here is a release of subglacial water. Like this, perhaps what's happening is that this uh, massive melt event occurring in early July is uh, facilitating development of a subglacial network that allows uh, subglacial water that's been stored for some time and in, in, in contact with the subglacial environment is then being released after this big uh, melt event. So, so some of the conclusions of, of this study is that what, what this suggests is that there is an activation of water that's stored in subglacial environments in, in 2012. What we also see is that um, not looking at this nested basin analysis, that uh, uh, some of the meltwater that's reaching the ocean is, in, is coming from the interior. And uh, we, but we also see this indications that as much as 54% of runoff can be retained near the margin. And uh, while some of it is being released in the cold season with a delay, it can explain all of this. All right, we still don't know how this small catchment can be upscaled to, to a larger catchment or the entire Greenland. Because the Watson River, for example, the bigger river, doesn't have observations during the winter time. So we don't know what's going on there. But all of this points to a hydrological system of the Greenland ice sheets that's quite complex. And there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to understand it, to understand how the hydrology interacts with uh, with the ice sheet velocity and dynamics so that we can uh, understand uh, global sea level rise into, into the future. So I, with that, I'm just going to end and uh, thank uh, NASA, who's closed at the moment, hopefully open soon. <laughs>
So we can go back next summer and collect more data for their NASA for their generous support and then just list some of my collaborators here. So thank you and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Yes. Uh, so the, I, I think there is something different going on. If you go back to your previous slide, last chemistry slide. Here, yes. The, the, it is not the storage. Uh, what you have is just a simple dilution and concentration. So you have water, mm -hmm. large amount of water coming down, and therefore you have less concentration. Uh, versus the higher concentration when the volume of the water goes down. Right. So that is observed in riverine systems all the time. Okay, like the dilution of the, the chloride just there? By, just by dilution, no, the cations. The cations, but, but, the, but what the peak then, like you have an increase in the cations. That's like, because you have no water there. The flow is very, very minimal. Well, it's declining, right? But why, why is it, uh, why is it like, uh, it's sort of this, uh, I mean, you see two different s patterns here. Like, why is chloride different from the cations? I, th I think you're right. Chlorine, yeah. chlorine is very different in terms of where it is coming mm -hmm. from, where it's sourced from, than the cations are. Cations are coming from uh, rock weathering. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's a question of uh, how much water is there to mm -hmm. dilute the concentration. And if you have more water, uh, if the concentration goes down. Is that simple? But is the volume of water in the subglacial basins not also going, increasing also, and the concentrations of the cations are increasing? So why do you see two different trends then? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't, don't see the two trends. Well, it's hard to see because we don't, we don't have like good data before and after the event. We only kind of see it at the time. So, so, uh, you know, yeah, we have I see what he's saying. It's like observation in the river systems mm -hmm. is that the concentration of a cation mm -hmm. goes down when you have flood stage right. versus when you have a lean stage, and and uh, for you know so this very similar thing can right. be considered to be happening. So it's not necessary yeah. that you have a storage somewhere that is being packed. Right. Uh, it could uh, just be like, so maybe what, what you would suggest then is that uh, you would expect that if we had more dense observations here, you would see more higher cation concentration as well. Absolutely. And the same here. Yeah, well, I guess here we, yeah, over here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, but it's still, I mean, that must come. So there's a dilution of the system, but it's, it's because the dilution is coming from the supra, like the melting of the surface, and then it ceases. So you have like increased. It must come from the from the subglacial environment. I think but it yeah, does. yeah, it does. It yeah. Does. Yes. Does uh, ice evaporate at similar rates to water? Oh, excuse me. Does the ice evaporate at similar rates to water evaporation? Um, oh, and I don't know, but uh, the total uh, like sublimation and evaporation, I think it's about like 10%, maybe a couple of percent, maybe 10% of, of the total math, like mass loss. So I'm sort of thinking of the Earth and the terrestrial yeah. places that isn't all of the water that's ever been on the Earth built here. Glacier happens to be storing right. I mean, more and more over the last ten thousand years, but the total amount of water and how much we do it by evaporation uh -huh. on the sea surface, on the ice versus the the wet ice, is it a big part of the equation? If it go away by evaporation, I mean, some some water. will leave by, but I don't know if any. I don't think anybody looked at like. I mean, there's no like analysis of trend as far as I know. I don't know if anybody else are aware of it, but okay, but it but you could imagine if you I mean what we saw like from like the last couple of years you have from 2007 to 2012 is quite warm in Greenland, so you you have you know you could expect maybe more evaporation during that time, but I don't I don't have numbers. I guess similar to the fact that the what, liquid water absorbs huge amounts of CO2. 
solar radiation. Yeah. Ice reflects heat and ice. But some of that energy in going into the liquid water is just evaporation effects. Don't know what it means. Yeah. Yeah, I have some colleagues that are looking at like feedback effects of the water vapor, but I, I don't know. It's I don't yeah. Yeah. The, the linkage between the, the melt water and ice uh, dynamics, mm -hmm. the speed, is there any uh, effect between seasons or is there is it all occurring all the phenomenon occurring within the one season or is there an effect of what happened the previous season? Right. I don't know. I mean, you could imagine. That's something I've been thinking about whether or not, you know, it could. You, the, the, I, I think there are some studies suggesting that it could be some kind of carryover effect between years. I mean, certainly um, there's this modeling study of. Um, of uh, looking at the connections between uh, surface melting and, and uh, subglacial meltwater transportation that suggests that like, you, you're going to have some meltwater being retained and sort of keep a, a high water pressure over the winter. Like it doesn't, the, the channels don't freeze up entirely. You have like some unfrozen water that keeps a, a higher water pressure. So I think you could imagine that, that there might be some effect that, that might carry over. From year to year, but yeah. Did you see uh, some some effect of that 2012 event? Yeah, like I, yeah, this year. I mean, we didn't see anything. <laughs> it was like not. Yeah, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to look at the velocities of 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 of. of I mean, because maybe for example, we would see that 2013 like. Like that would that that totally is a, a year with low melt water, right? And but it may also be low velocities. If you're if if 2012, like you, you had generation of, of this efficient drainage system. So maybe if some of it's still intact, you would expect melt water being transported rapidly. And even in 13, where you have less melt water produced, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. So is the idea now that it's sort of a Goldilocks situation in terms of the velocity and meltwater relationship where you need, you need some water down there to increase the pressure at the base and, and take some of the load, basically decrease the, the friction there. But if you have too much water, then you start connecting all these channels and the water is able to escape. Well, I mean, that's like what the Sundal paper suggests and there are other papers that points in that direction too, like looking at even at, you know, the, um, there's a study using tracers in, in this area that sort of suggests the same thing where you see over the season, you see a, a, a increased connectivity inland where you apply sense, uh, tracers at different uh, distances from the ice margin and, uh, and as, as the season progress, you start seeing uh, faster uh, um, lower, um, faster transport times for, for the places you have in the interior. So there's other pieces of evidence that point in that direction. But at the same time, you know, this is studies that's only, I mean, that, that paper's from 2011. So I think it's like, I think the, the I, I don't know what's going to be the knowledge in 10 years. But, uh, but I mean, people are working on models, trying to look at this at, from a modeling perspective, using tracers, looking at uh, the ice sheet velocity, and so on. So I think, I, I don't know. But, but it's, we'll see where we are. You figure it out. <laughs> yeah. I had a question about the estimation of the meltwater production. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a couple weather stations there nearby. Yeah. What, were you driving a physical meltwater model? Was yeah. It's just, which one was it? What were you? It, uh, so I, I used, I've been working with using uh, two models, uh, output from two models. So one is the, um, is a model. It's a, it's a surface energy uh, model. So you know th these stations they measure all like the incoming solar, outgoing solar, long wave, snow depth, uh, all kinds of things, wind, and you know so they can really parameterize these models pretty well. 
And I'm using uh, models uh, developed by uh, Michel van der Broekes group in uh, Utrecht, and, uh, and also uh, Dirk van Aas at, um, at the, uh, uh, what's it called, Geos, yeah, Danish and Greenland Geological Survey. So those, those two, and they're similar, but a little different. Yeah. Did you validate those against any ablation measurements up in the on the ice sheet? Um, no. I but they are. Um, but they have. I mean, they have also those. Uh, they. They those ABS stations also. I. I think it's an input to the model, or it's like they've tuned the model to, to the, um, to the ablation, because they have they have like uh, they can they they, they 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 measure the the changing elevations. So they have they they estimate. Uh, let's see. I think uh, Dirk van Aas estimates his. Um, I think he has an error estimate. It's like fifteen percent uncertainty, of uh, of the. Daily estimates, so that's probably so comparing that's, to observations. You were using the difference between the amount of melt modeled and what you're seeing come off the ice sheet to verify yeah. what's stored in the ice sheet. Yeah. But the mesh estimate of how much melt was produced, you just said it had a fifty percent error. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, yep. Uh, I don't know how, how long we can. Maybe this is the last one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah last. Last question. I uh, been to that area of the forest and an mm -hmm. engineer, and I came away without thinking about why it's happening, suggesting that we should uh, we should uh, dam up the Watson River rather than Chinese River. Oh yeah. <laughs> and why not? Well, let me give you one. <laughs> so, so let's tell you, tell you why not. One argument for not, well, not doing it is, uh, besides the environmental impact on that area, is it also has a lot of sediment in it. So it might, if, if you dam it up, it may, um, may that dam might be filled up uh, quite quickly. But, but they are like they have uh, up. Uh, they are in Greenland thinking about hydropower from from some of these rivers, and they just. Uh, opened one, I think it was last summer, up in uh, north of Ilulissat. I don't know, maybe some of the Eiger students know this better than me. Uh, and so they are harnessing some of, uh, of the energy in, in meltwater from Greenland. But, but that, where they are doing that is like the, the meltwater has passed through like some lakes, so it has been allowed to, to sediment somehow. But I, I don't think it's straightforward to I don't know, maybe you get, some people know more, probably somebody here knows more than me about building dams downstream glaciers, but I think you want to have to think about like what, what all that sediment is going to do to the dam, to the turbines, so. We'll find out soon. I'm Alaska. thinking more of just not letting You'll find out in Alaska. They're going to take a whack at it. Yeah. They're going to take a whack at it, yeah. <laughs> Might be just the only thing we can do. Well, it would be. I mean, they are—they are trying. They are certainly thinking about how to benefit from that in Greenland. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.